2023 has been a hard year. Do I hear amen? All over the world. Political unrest, wars, economic upheaval, natural disasters, unthinkable violence, and unresolved racial and religious tensions, it, it demands that we move beyond the sloppy sentimentality that is often attached to this time of year to ask, what does the coming of Jesus Christ mean in a world like ours? The world is so filled with chaos and discord and, and hatred that the very idea of brokenness being restored to wholeness and disharmony being replaced by harmony seems like a giant fairy tale. But God, the creator, has not abandoned this world that he has made. Um, Christmas reminds us that the Prince of Peace has entered the world and has become one of us to reconcile us to God and to each other and to heal our brokenness and to restore our hope. And Advent gives us the time to stop, step back, and to see what God has done and is doing in our world today. Oh, come, let us adore him. Now, the word Advent literally comes from the Latin word Adventus, which literally means arrival or visit. And uh, I always have appreciated this whole notion of Advent, the notion of an arrival or in a visit, because my eldest daughter was born in December, and my two grandsons were born in December. Do you get it? See what's going on here? Arrivals, visits. And, um, and uh, so many marvelous things have happened to me at Christmas time. Yes, I am a Christmas nerd. I'll be upfront about it. I listen to Christmas music all year round. And uh, I just have never been able to quite get beyond the wonder that God stepped down from heaven and became one of us. Keep in mind that though resurrection is the focus of many of our teaching about salvation and, and, you know, having a relationship with God that will extend to the future, keep in mind, no incarnation, no resurrection. It started here. This is the beginning of God's um, redemptive plan has its own fold in the New Testament. Now, I don't know what you think of when you think of Advent. We don't talk a lot about it in our circles as a rule. Uh, many times when you think of Advent, you think of what? A calendar, right? <laughs> Where you get a chocolate for every day of the month. Has everybody got theirs already? You know? I found out now you can get Advent ca calendars for anything. Nespresso has now got an Advent calendar. You get a new pot of coffee every single day. Of the How delightful is that? Or if you're a collector of hockey cards, you can get a, a hockey card advent calendar. And every day you open it up and there's a new hockey card and a new, new hockey player. I mean, Lego. Like, you just name it. There, there is an advent calendar for it. But in the life of the church, advent describes a four-week window that begins this year on December 3rd. It's a four-week window uh, in the church calendar leading up to Christmas Day. And Advent is actually the beginning of the church calendar. So we think of January 1st as the beginning of the year. In the liturgical calendar, the first Sunday of Advent is the beginning of the liturgical year. And in a preliterate society when there is no, you know, um, books and, you know, social media and cell phones and, you know, you know computers, um, Advent served a very valuable purpose in bringing people together in a tangible way to remember that God has entered into this world. And so Advent was set aside to encourage faithful souls to prepare their hearts for a personal encounter with the God who came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ. If we ever needed an encounter with God to remind us that this is still a world where he still rules despite the chaos, this is certainly one of those years. So, this year, the season of Advent begins a couple of weeks from now, and we're going to be marking it with a short set of videos that I'm going to introduce next Sunday before the service starts, and Bible reflections to help us ponder the meaning of the Incarnation that God took on human form and dwelt among us. How many people here love a good story? Okay. Now, those of you that didn't raise your hands, you're not, not being honest. We all love a good story. In fact, many of us like to think of ourselves as 
pretty good storytellers, right? Am I right? Yeah. We like to be able to tell stories as well. Each one of us navigates this world with our own set of opinions and feelings and theories and experiences. And this unique um, combination of thoughts and feelings makes up our personal story. Stories are how we make sense of the world around us. Our stories not only inform us, but they propel our every action. We live out our stories. Now, I don't know you until I know your story. And you don't really know me until you know my story. We all have our way of looking at the world, and we live our life out of a story. Our personal stories always take shape against a much larger backdrop, of course, and in relationship to God's purposes for us in the world. And that is what people of faith, we can never afford to forget. That whatever your personal circumstances are, however you've been raised, however you've been brought up, whatever makes up your personal story, your story takes place against the backdrop of a much bigger story that began in the book of Genesis and ends in the book of Revelation. And part of what it means to become a follower of Jesus Christ is to have your story grafted into the big story of what God is doing redemptively throughout all time. You and I play a part. We are included in what God is doing if you know Jesus Christ as Lord. I love the way Eugene Peterson puts it. I think I put it on your outline. God is the larger context and plot in which our stories find themselves. Think about that. God is the larger context and the plot in which our stories find themselves. It's as we inhabit this larger story that our own stories have meaning. If you joined us for the Reframe series, that was a big theme throughout the Reframe series. Um, the storyteller's claim, according to Frederick Buechner, is that life has meaning. That the things that happen to people happen not just by accident, life like leaves being blown off a tree by the wind, but that there is order and purpose deep down behind them or inside them, and they're not leading us just anywhere, but they're leading us somewhere. And the power of stories is that they're telling us that life adds up somehow, that life itself is like a story. And that's why people like Paul can write in Romans chapter 8, 28, and God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God has got the ability to redeem our stories and include them in his big story. Now, almost always, all, all of us have our favorite Christmas story. And I mean, I have a ton of them because Christmas was a big deal in the Nelson household. And so I can go back and I'm thinking, I should write a book because I know I've got 12 or 13 or 14 chapters of Christmas stories, you know, Christmas meditations, real life uh, examples of things that happened that were both touching and moving and we're filled with a sense of the wonder of God and we're decisive times in my life. Well, you have those kinds of stories too, don't you? Whether it is fictional invention or a slice of real life experience, we love stories that um, excite our imagination and stir our emotions. I know I do. And those stories remind us about the things that really matter in life. Have you ever been reading a story or hearing a testimony or reading scripture and you find that tingly feeling and tears come to your eyes and when that happens, pay attention, because the Holy Spirit is usually saying something to your heart in those moments through that story. He is reaching out to you. We love stories because they suggest that there's meaning in life, that there is meaning in our own lives, that this is all going somewhere, that it makes sense. And they lead us to new ways of seeing and new ways of being in the world. And maybe, just maybe, they nudge us back on the right track and allow us to recover the things that we've lost through busyness and selfishness and neglect. So, this is where I'm going to invite you into the story. Because I believe you all have Christmases to remember, okay? And it may be one or it may be several, but as a part of this series, on Christmas Eve, December 24th, in this class time, I would like to hear some of your stories. Moments where Something significant happened at the Christmas time that made you more aware of God, more aware of God's grace, more aware of the people around you. 
And um, I'm going to invite you to think about this for the next week or two. And uh, if, there is a, 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 if there's a story in your life that you really think is worth telling at Christmas, I'd like you to just write it down. No more than one page, one side, double spaced. <laughs> okay, okay. And if you'll pass it into me by email or drop it off to me, I'd like to pick some of those stories to share on, um, on Christmas Eve, just as we kind of prepare our hearts for everything that Christmas Day represents. By the way, I did this um, a few years ago, more years ago than I, I, I hate to admit, um, with a group of young moms at a church that I was pastoring. And I sort of did it, you know, just to kind of bring them in. I still have saved those stories. 40 years later, I still have them. Because how God broke from eternity into time in real life circumstances in people's lives is something that just moves you to worship and gratitude. And I believe that some of you have stories that would do the same thing. So I'm gonna take a big risk here, big risk, and get you to think about a Christmas to remember, your Christmas to remember. And if you'd be willing to share your story with the rest of the class, um, just write it down, send it to me by email or give it to me in the hall and uh, we'll see what will take place on the 24th. This is totally crazy, right? Totally radical. I'm counting on you to provide the content for that day. So we'll see whether or not my trust is well-placed or not. Okay, so there you go. Now, to kick things off today, I want us to consider some remarkable stories from the Scripture, stories of the original eyewitnesses to the first Christmas itself. And their stories are going to be our subject for the next few weeks. And as we will discover, our stories find their beauty and meaning against the backdrop of God's big story. And maybe, just maybe, as we remember these stories, we will find new meaning and hope in our own stories. The Christian story, the Christmas story, claims to give us the very meaning of life itself. Uh, I love the writing of Frederick Buechner on some of these big moments in Scripture. And he writes this, he says, the story that Christmas tells, of course, claims to give us more than a clue, in fact, to give us no less than the meaning of life itself. And it is not just of some lives, but it is of all our lives. And it goes a great deal further than in claiming to give the meaning of God's life among men, the extraordinary tale it tells of love between God and man and love conquered and love conquering and long lost love and love that sometimes look like hate. So in one sense, the Christmas story tells us uh, that it can be so simply told that we can really get the whole thing on a very small Christmas card or in the two crossed pieces of wood that form its symbol. In another sense, it is so vast and complex that the whole Bible can only point at it. Just love the prose that Beekner gives us to sort of help us to begin the wonder of what it is that God has done for us in Christ. The Christmas story is about the drama of human life and the meaning of God's life among men. And the story of Christmas is the beginning of Jesus Christ's story. And somehow, all of our stories are bound up with his. It's the gospel writer Luke who is the author of so many of the images that we have at the first Christmas. We'll see lots of them over the next few weeks. And at the very beginning of his gospel, this is what he writes. He says, Many have undertaken to drop an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. And with this in mind, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, and I have decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. Today, we're going to take a few moments to stop and consider Mary's story, the mother of Jesus. And the reason why Luke's account of Mary's story in the drama of Christmas is the most detailed of the Gospels is because Mary herself was likely his primary source. The encounter between Mary and the angel Gabriel, the only person who could have remembered it, and depicted it and called it forward would be Mary herself. And so um, this is how Luke writes the story of that incredible encounter. Now, listen, friends, we have got 2,000 years of church history. We have got scriptures written in every language, interpretations more than we can account. 
We have all experienced 10, 20, 30, some of us 60 <laughs> Christmases as a follower of Jesus. Mary had none of that. She had the promise of a Messiah, and here she was, probably a teenage girl, in a far-off corner of, of Judea, uh, just going about her everyday life. And then one night, one night, this happens. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying. I can just only imagine. She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what kind of a greeting this might be. Okay? So think about this. Teenage Jewish girl in Judea, in Nazareth, kind of a backwater, really, in the country. Mind your own business, going about, looking at the prospect of, of marriage at some particular point. Um, and all of a sudden, an angel shows up in her room and speaks to her in this way. I thought Luke didn't tell us the half of it. She was greatly troubled and was trying to discern what kind of a greeting that might be. Can you just put, herself in, uh, put yourself in her shoes? Trying to think, oh, what is going down? And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, <laughs> Mary, for you have found favor with God. Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. By the way, if you know Jesus Christ is Lord, these words can be as powerful to you in this moment as they were to Mary. Uh, put your own name in there. Do not be afraid, Mick, for you have found favor with God. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are now his beloved son or daughter. Keep that in mind. And behold, he says to Mary, you will conceive in your womb and you'll bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Don't have to worry about going through all the baby books, trying to come up with a name. It's all pretty much straightforward right here. And he will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kindness, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, she didn't say it quite this way, but she says, okay, <laughs> so how will this be? Because I'm a virgin, right? And the angel said to her, listen, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called holy, the Son of God. I don't know about you, but this is an incredible passage of Scripture to ponder just to kind of be in the room hearing this conversation between the angel Gabriel and Mary. She's kind of brought into, her story is brought into God's big story of redemption. And to some degree or another, all of our stories are included in some way. We don't always get an angel. Some of you may have got an angel. I didn't. But uh, you may have got somebody who intersected your life in an unsurprising and unexpected way and nudged you in the direction of faith in Jesus. And that, to me, is just like a divine encounter. It's a divine appointment set up just for you. Uh, it's one of those things that we never forget. And so begins Mary's story. A time, a place, a cast of characters, a promise made, a happening on the horizon. And so we follow her story through the pages of the gospel but she enters God's redemptive story just here, where her story intersects God's story. Now, I don't know about you. Sometimes life is stranger than fiction, right? Have you ever run into a circumstance of life and you thought, listen, nobody could have made this up. No fiction writer could have. This is so incredible, so out of the ordinary, like nobody would have dreamed of this ever happening. Sometimes real life is stranger even than fiction. And sometimes our real life stories are so incredible that people have a hard time believing it <laughs> because they weren't walking it when we were walking it. It's just somehow God intervenes in our lives in all kinds of ways. And sometimes the imagination fails to comprehend the complexities of real life as it unfolds. 
There's a lot of things that Mary understood that first night and a lot of things she didn't. A lot of it would become clear to her over a period of, of time. Now, a paradox, does anybody know what a paradox is? Okay, it's got nothing to do with footwear. Paradox, okay. A paradox is a statement or a situation that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense and yet it rings true. It's something that says two things at the same time. Uh, it points in two different directions. It's, it's like a sign that says, you know, Vancouver and an arrow pointing in both directions. And you have to decide, okay, like which one is it? And it's both. Mary's story is defined by paradox. The most obvious paradox is the reality of purity or holiness in the account of a birth of a child to an unwed mother. Now, I don't know about you, but how often do we put that together? Unwed mother. Holiness, unwed mother, purity. That's not the first connection we normally make between those two terms. Now, the fact that she was an unwed mother, that's not news. That happens all the time. It happens in our day and age. But Mary's response is the twist as she asks in innocence, like, how is this going to happen? How will this be? Like, I understand how this all thing works. And like, okay, <laughs> I know there's this Joseph thing going over here on the side. What is this? You know, uh, and what about the purity of Joseph in marrying her and shielding her and not having intercourse with her until after Jesus was born? Like, folks, this is unbelievable stuff. This is eye popping type of stuff. It's virtually unbelievable by today's standards. And yet so significant was what took place in Mary and Joseph's life that they decided to throw it all uh, on their faith in God. And again, keep in mind, they had nothing to buttress this faith other than an encounter with the angel and some of the ancient prophecies, which the angel sort of brings some of those forward. And so, you know, they hear hints of the Old Testament, and uh, now they are on center stage as God has made his announcement of his big entrance. It really is mind-boggling. And then the second paradox that I see in this story is the story of joy in what normally would have been a tragedy, okay? Um, now, in those days, it wasn't quite like our days, though our days has its own issues when it comes to an unwanted pregnancy or an unexpected pregnancy to somebody who's not married. Uh, in Mary's time, this would have been a big, big deal. It means that though she had promised to keep herself for Joseph, that somewhere along the line, she had broke her promise. That's the first thing that people would assume. Um, public humiliation, uh, the loss of her betrothed, which we know from the Christmas story was a very real threat. Uh, even potential stoning, if you followed the Old Testament law to the letter, um, was the normal end of the kind of story that was unfolding for somebody like Mary. But when Mary tells Elizabeth the news, her cousin erupts in joy. And Mary is inspired to sing her own song of praise. Somehow or another, in spite of all the cultural baggage, Elizabeth gets it. And she celebrates it when Mary comes. In fact, it says even the baby in her womb, who would later be John the Baptist, leaped at the fact that Jesus, the mother of the Messiah, was in his presence, his unborn presence. And so this is a story that should have a really, really, really bad ending, but it turns out to have an incredible turn of events. Like it is the plot twist. That's something that should have been a source of tragedy. It ends up being a moment of joy. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction. And then the last great paradox in this story is found in the manger itself. That one born in such humble surroundings was none other than the God of glory, the creator of all things. The creator of all things. This is the ultimate mind blower in the story of Christmas, and it's why I personally can never get over it. Every Christmas is, I just find myself caught up with the wonder of what God did on that first Christmas night and showing up, not with an army, but with a manger, in a manger. Uh, that God would enter this world the way we all enter this world. And uh, he had to learn to walk, and he had to learn to talk, and there were some messes to clean up. Like he was a human baby, but he was more than that. 
He was the son of God. And, uh, and so you just think of all the different ways God could come in and make himself known. Like today, you know, what would be his platform today? If God was coming into the world and wanted the whole world to know about, you know, we always worry about our platform, you know, how we're being presented. Yeah, well, God didn't try to create a platform. He just showed up in person as a baby in that manger. And that's the greatest paradox of all, that God would enter his world that he created in this humble way. It's almost unbelievable. Now, Mary's story is a surprising part of this love story between God and man. And, and Beekner writes this. I have to admit, I just find myself always going back to him at Christmas time. He says, there is a time when the story begins, and therefore there's a time before it begins, when it is coming and not here yet. And this is the time that Mary was in when Gabriel came to her. She was in the Advent moment between God's promise and God's fulfillment. That's where her story takes place. So why does the Christmas story matter? Well, again, you know, uh, years ago, years ago, Daryl Johnson, anybody remember Daryl? He used to be the pastor over here at First Baptist. He's written a number of books. Perhaps you've read some of his books. Years ago, I ran across one of his sermons called The Sleepy Invasion. I love the name of that title. I wish I'd have thought of it myself, but it's, it's Daryl's. I have to give him full credit. And this is what Daryl Johnson says in that sermon. He says, God has invaded this planet, but he did so as a baby, a man. And his invasion was a sleepy invasion, and this is the wonder of Christmas. Will we ever fully plumb the depth of this event? Lying in that cattle trough, in that cave that was used for a stable, behind a hotel in Jerusalem was God, the Lord. And in the words of Martin Luther's Christmas hymn, he whom the world cannot enwrap, yonder lies in Mary's lap. How wonderfully poetically said. Here is history's turning point, the greatest event in all of history, and the only sign we have of it is a baby lying in a manger. I've been reading a book just recently, well, more than one book, several, that are talking about the coming of AI, okay? Artificial intelligence. Any of you are aware of it? By the way, it's, in, it's influencing you now, whether you realize it or not. And, uh, and that is basically they have trained computers to do a lot of the number crunching that allows it to do some things for much more than we do. And, of course, the answer is, you know, will they ever be able to create a robot that is sentient and is, you know, like a transhuman, either remade from a human or... or and, and so, the, so the discussion is out there. And, you know, as people of faith, the answer is no. They never will. Because nothing that broken man creates has a soul. Only God is one who can give someone a soul. No one can love like God can except a human being made in his image. Um, you know, they talk about superintelligence. Folks, the superintelligence has already entered the world uh, in, a, in the... In, in, the, in a manger in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. So there's already a superintelligence out there. We're not waiting for it to come. There's already a singularity that has taken place. God has entered the world in the person of Jesus, and he has risen from the dead. Like all of these things that in our world people are trying to accomplish technologically, God has already been way ahead of the game, way ahead of the game. Now, you know, whatever you think of AI, there's some good things, there's some bad things, uh, but the reality is, you know, can... Um, can, you know, AI ever replace human beings created in the image of God with a soul? I'm thinking there's not a hope that man can, will ever pull that off. So don't panic, okay? God is with you wherever you are. James Montgomery Boyce says anyone can understand the Christmas story by knowing just three things. Three things. I didn't put it on your outline, but you might want to just jot it down. Number one, I'm a sinner. Okay? Uh, I'm a broken person. I'm doing the best I can, but I'm a broken person. As a sinner, I need a savior. That's the second thing. First thing you need to realize to appreciate the Christmas story is I'm a sinner. And the second thing is, as a sinner, I need a savior. And the third thing you need to remember is that the Christ of the cradle is the savior you need. That's the Christmas story 
in a nutshell. That God, looking at us, was not prepared to let us wander around in darkness, but he sent the light of life to rescue us in the person of Jesus Christ. It was his plan from the very beginning of time. So how do we respond to this incredible story? Well, let's take a lesson from the eyewitnesses of the event themselves. And again, I'm, I'm going back to Luke chapter 2. And when they saw it, the shepherds, by the way, we'll talk about them maybe in three weeks. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered, circle that, wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things in her heart. Circle that word treasured. And pondering them. Circle the word pondering. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God, underlying glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. The very first thing we should do every Christmas, but let's just work on 2023. The very first thing we should do is stop and reflect. That's what goes in the blank. Stop and reflect so that the awe and the wonder of it can lead us to adoration in praise. Be amazed by the incarnation. Let it stretch your mind. Make time over Christmas to think over what you know of God and try to understand his ways more completely, especially his ways in terms of your life. Slow down. Ponder his love, his power, his mercy, his grace, his wisdom. I could go on and on. And then has has the reality of who God is and what he's done for us takes a hold of your heart, then just worship and praise him in a way that works for you. So the first thing to do is we need to stop and reflect. And of course, you know, sometimes for many of us at Christmas, it's a time where you step on the gas pedal and speed up to get all the things done that need to get done for Christmas. You know, the stuff that needs to be bought and the meals that need to be made and the friends that need to be invited over and all the staff Christmas party and all the church Christmas parties and so on and so forth. I'm suggesting resist the momentum of the Christmas season and find some ways to just stop and reflect on the wonder of the incarnation. And then the second thing we should do is allow deep gratitude and joy to lead us to a fresh opening of your life to the Christ of Christmas. Friends, he is with us. Whatever your circumstances, he is with you. He's as close as the mention of his name. I don't know how difficult life may seem for you to be right now, or maybe it's just going along swimmingly, but until you stop and consider what it is that God has done in the person of Jesus Christ, it's really hard to find that joy and gratitude. But joy and gratitude is just a part of what it means to worship God, and we want to worship him this Christmas. Let him flood your life with his love and his peace and joy and meaning. And the third thing we should do is spread the news. Go tell it on the mountain, folks. Uh, But you cannot share what you haven't first felt and experienced. And that's why stop and reflecting and joy and gratitude precedes being able to tell the story. So Today, in whatever situation that we find ourselves, in the face of the turmoil and uncertainty of the world around us, let us prepare our hearts to enter the um, unfolding story of God's redemptive plan by affirming the great promises of our faith uh, fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to get you to do with me something we never do at Broadway. We are going to do, are are you seated? Everybody seated? Seatbelt on? I'm going to ask you to join me in a responsive reading. Okay. Now, responsive reading, it's not complicated. Um, I am going to uh, share a line, and then you will share out loud, has a group, the bolded line. Okay. And we'll go back and forth until we're done. Can you handle it? Okay. Is everybody with me? Okay. So, let us proclaim, it is not true that creation and the human family are doomed to destruction and loss. This is true. It is not true that we must accept inhumanity and discrimination, hunger and poverty, death and destruction. This is true. It is not true that violence and hatred should have the last word. This is true. (laughs) 
Now, it's, it's not true. It's not true that we are simply victims of the powers of evil who seek to rule the world. This is true. It's just not true that we have to wait for those who are especially gifted, who are the prophets of the church, before we can be peacemakers. This is true. It's not true, friends, that our hopes for the liberation of humankind, of justice, of human dignity, and of peace are not meant for this earth and for this history. This is true. So let us move on from Advent to Christmas with hope, even hope against hope, And let us see visions of love and peace and justice. Let us affirm with humility and with faith and courage. That's what Christmas is all about. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that we've had together to kind of stop and reflect, maybe to feel some of the, you know, (laughs) confusion that Mary felt, but also the joy that Elizabeth felt as we consider that you have not left us in the darkness, but into our darkness you have shone a great light in the person of Jesus Christ. May he shine into every one of our hearts and every one of our stories this Christmas. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Amen. God bless you, each one.